without further ado, it is my incredible pleasure to introduce the director of our Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute here at GSU, Ms. Jennifer Sherrod. Dr. Jennifer Sherrod. Thank you, Erica. And I'm not, she has covered everything that you need to know, and so I, you can go ahead and, and introduce John and bring John. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So Jennifer is going to uh, facilitate our conversation today, but you guys are here to hear our featured speaker. John L., like I said, we have a real live investor here with us today, and I'm going to read you his brief bio, and then Jennifer's going to spend the next hour just asking some questions to give you guys a better understanding of what it really means to have a conversation with an investor. John joined Nora Mosley Partners NMP in August of 2015 and supports the firm's investments in software and IT companies. John started as a vice president and is now a general partner on the firm's investment committee. John currently serves on the board of five portfolio companies. Prior to joining an NMP, John worked on the investment team at Marlin Equity Partners, which is a global private equity firm with eight billion of capital under management that specializes in investing in tech companies, Previously, he started his career at Harris Williams & Company, a middle market investment bank focused on M&A mergers and acquisitions. John received a BS in systems engineering and an MS in commerce from the University of Virginia, Virginia, a university that is close to both of our hearts. Go who's. Um, so stickers. with that. <laughs> I see the stickers on the last uh, one. Yes, and the man, yes, long story, don't get me started. So without further ado, please give a warm entrepreneur welcome to John Hale. So it was the one. Well, thank you, Erica, and um, welcome, John. It's, it's, it's especially fun to have a, um, a fellow University of Virginia grad um, uh, on GSU's campus, um, but we're going to... Um, uh, by the time we're done, uh, his uh, blood will run blue um, uh, if we do it right, right? So, yes. um, so welcome to, to Georgia State, John. And um, let's, um, so, so first of all, I'll, I'll tell the audience, um, if, if we want to make this conversational um, for those of you both in the room, but also online. And so, uh, as, as, as Ms. Bracey said, if you have questions online, please put them in the chat. And if you have questions in the audience, please raise your hand, okay, and, and chime in. We want this to be conversational, so ask questions throughout. Um, but we'll get started um, with, um, we want to hear a little bit, John, about your personal story. So, um, so, so tell us um, how, maybe tell us about your firm first and what you do, and then talk to us about how you got into investing. Sure. So we are a, we call it an early growth equity firm. So we're not quite venture capital, which will go uh, pre-revenue at some points. Our companies have traction, usually around two million in revenue is uh, when we get started. And growth equity is a little bit later stage, private equity is even later stage than that. So these companies have product markets fit. They've demonstrated strong traction with their customers. They're growing very quickly. And uh, that is a stage that we get involved. In terms of what type of companies we invest in, it's software and healthcare. Uh, about 80% of what we do is going to be uh, business to business software. Um, and uh, within software, uh, we're gonna be doing you know, cybersecurity investments, supply chain investments, basically boring meat and potato businesses are what's exciting to us. Um, and then on the healthcare side, it's how do we make what is a very inefficient system more efficient? Uh, that's that's really where we're spending time. But we're you know a two hundred fifty million dollar fund. Uh, there are nine people on our investment team uh, deploying those dollars. We do about fifteen uh, deals per per fund, so fifteen portfolio companies, and we're taking a minority stake, so owning anywhere between. 15 to 25 percent of a business on average taking a board seat on the board of directors uh, during that and really helping these early stage companies scale and these are you know companies that have hopefully have uh, a total addressable market over a billion dollars they've got a domain expert as the ceo or founder at the time again they're growing quickly sometimes 100% year-over-year year growth, if not faster, uh, at least 50% uh, year-over-year growth. They've got very strong unit economics, so 
This isn't going to be your uh, you know, DoorDash or Lyft of the world that have negative gross uh, profit margins. These are businesses with uh, you know, significant unit economics where they're uh, based on their gross margins. They're, they're generating a lot of cash per uh, deal they do with customers. And we're helping these companies, again, get from a point in time where things are going well, but it's early to a stage where they're much more scaled and we can uh, give them more optionality. They can raise more capital. Uh, they can sell uh, you know, to a strategic company or they can sell to a private equity firm. So we sold businesses to Microsoft, IBM, Philips, uh, and a laundry, Dell, a laundry list of other different companies. So. A little bit about our firm, uh, you know, it's been around 40 years, the lar longest tenured private equity firm in the Southeast. Uh, the founding partners retired about uh, almost 20 years ago, and our current two lead partners have been running the firm since then. Yeah, great. And so what got you interested in investing? How did you decide you wanted to do that for a career? I was an engineer undergrad. Uh, it was in UVA and most of my class. Uh, we love the idea of going to, I guess I love the concept of consulting, but I realized with consulting, you kind of just give a proposal and the client chooses what you need to do versus you can actually make some changes yourself or help build yourself. You, instead of making recommendations, you're sort of part, uh, you can be part of the building process as an investor, particularly as an investor who has a meaningful influence of the board seat. So that sort of fast forward 15 years since I've, you know, or so since I graduated, that's been uh, you know where I am now. What got me there was just realizing I like finance. I didn't really I, I like the concept of consulting. How could I kind of you know get skin in the game is the other thing. Consultants just get paid a fee and uh, offer their opinion, but have no sort of equity ownership or upside based on the decisions they make. Uh, as an investor, you're owning equity of a company. So if we get in and the company's valued at $20 million and we can make it generate a value of $100 million, we're making you know, significant upside in that. That really you know, in, interested me from an incentive mechanism. So that's, you know, backtracking, those are the little data points that got me interested in it. But really, what's kept me in it, because there's stuff that gets you interested in it, what's kept me in it is the CEOs that I talk to and just hearing that founder tell their story and be like, wow, this person is not only an expert, but passionate about this, but they also recognize they need help and they have a growth mindset. How do I leverage our platform that could come in and help you, you know, hire the right people to compliment you? Uh, really focus on what like we call it, you know, it's like sort of three legs of the stool, your people, your processes, and your product. And product's a huge piece, no matter what company you're building, but particularly in software, which is what we do. How do you advance your product and make it as you know, sticky as possible, but also as applicable to the widest sort of market as possible? That's what really got me interested in just seeing, honestly, the development of companies. I mean, one company, I got, in, it, I basically, the first company I sourced at Moore Mosley, uh, was a business that was a cybersecurity business that was around one million in revenue. It's now over a hundred million in revenue. It's you know the leader of its space. It has all these industry analysts uh, writing about it, and just seeing that sort of same founding team grow with the company up there uh, over the past seven or so years has been amazing to see. And I'm excited, you know, about the next seven years for them, even if we're not a part of the journey the whole way. Um, so you um, so you told us a little bit about the types of companies um, that you that your organization that normally invests in, um, and uh, and and you told us kind of what's fun about it for you. But how is an organization um, and, and you as an individual investor? How do you how do you assess a company and make a decision to ultimately invest in that company? Yeah, I mean we're fortunate where just the stage that we play. And I think the other filter dimension is so given we're based in Atlanta, we're investing in secondary and tertiary. Uh, capital geographies, so we're not investing in Silicon Valley. We're not. It's going to be tough for us to invest in like New York. We're only investing in North America, so we're not going to go to London or you know uh, China or India to, to do deals. We're focused on you know Atlanta is a great example of just a hub that's exploded over the last 10, 20 years. I mean, I, I sit on board seats in Atlanta, uh, Charlotte, Washington D.C., uh, Princeton, New Jersey, and Boise, Idaho. Uh, you know, the one I mentioned that went from 1 to 100 is in uh, Denver, Colorado. So, I mean, we're going to all these 
geographies, trying to find you know great entrepreneurs. I think COVID has actually flat, flattened the landscape where you can build a company anywhere. Um, uh, but anyways, yeah, I mean, back to what we're looking for out of those companies. I gave you some of the criteria, growing quickly in the target geographies that we're focused on. So we're not gonna do a deal in, in Silicon Valley. Why would they call us if there's so much money in Silicon Valley? Um, the, you know, certain industries we're focused on, technology and healthcare. Uh, and then really it's, it's uh, you know, performance of the business or various metrics that are sort of specific to software that makes sense for us. Uh, but you, it comes down, the big piece is gonna be that founder, CEO, and how much do they know about this space? How much is their, you know, do they really have a growth mindset? Do they sort of know what they don't know and want help there? And are they going to really look and have that high bar for talent to build a great team around them where they can move from being, you know, the micromanager wearing a million different hats, which you're probably all doing right now, is like maybe your own sole employee uh, of your company, uh, move from that stage to, you know, when we get involved, there's 20 or so employees. How do you go from having, you know, 100 jobs to, you know, maybe five jobs? And most of that is going to be delegating and trusting who you delegate to because they're so experienced and good at what they do. Yeah, growing. So what is growing quickly? It depends on what stage you, you are as a company. So um, if you're a publicly traded company and you're, you know, Microsoft, I mean, growing 20% year over year for them, that is extraordinary. That is world class. Like there's a reason they're, you know, stock price, you know, doubled or tripled uh, from like 2019 to its peaks in 2021. But they're also, you know, a two yet yeah, one time almost a two trillion dollar market cap business. We're getting involved. They're valued at two trillion dollars. We're, you know, getting involved in companies that are less than fifty million dollars in value. So, twenty percent is is not going to cut it for us, uh, just because it's much smaller numbers. I mean, they're those are hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars in revenue. Uh, so, growing, you know, twenty percent there is amazing. For us, it's you know doubling year over year really gets us excited. And if you're growing less than you know 100% year over year, there has to be some other underlying pieces to it. Like you know we call it retention rate. You're, if you're like a subscription business, how frequently are people coming back uh, to renewing your product? Uh, what is your gross margin back to that? Like if it's really high, that means you've got a very scalable technology, and you may need help with sales and marketing. Uh, there's a lot of sales and marketing metrics that we look at where it's like, hey, if we give this company more money, will they spend it efficiently? But I'd say that's sort of the growth we look at is, I'd say the, the rough bar is probably 100% year over year if you're less than 5 million in revenue. And if you're above 5 million, it's, you know, 50 to 75% gets us excited. Okay. Um, so, so you talked about, um, you know, a number of the things that you consider before you invest in a company. So geographical location is important. Um, uh, the rate of growth is important. Uh, the CEO, the founding team is important. The, obviously the industry, industry domain is important. But is there, are, is there one thing that's most important that's weighted more than something else? Or do you weight all of those things equally? And what are the... Yeah, I would say um, eventually, and this is not applicable to this room, it's going to be, I mean, the CEO is, is the most important thing. Who leads the company? Why are they so good at what they do? Um, we have the luxury, we don't find many of them, but if a CEO has sold a business before, like that's a narrow filter. Like who's sold a business before for, you know, a 200 plus million dollar exit? There's not that many people uh, in the world. If we can find someone like that and they want to go run a company or they're currently running a company, that's a huge plus to us because they've seen they've seen the movie before you call it. They, they know how to build a company. They know how to build a valuable company and do it uh, you know in a way that just back to valuable. They just know how to build a valuable company. That's tough to replicate. So for sort of backtracking most of our deals, we'll have like two uh, of those 15 for fun where it's a two-time CEO or multi-time CEO. Uh, for those first-time CEOs, it's, you know, how coachable are they? How much, about, back to growth mindset, you know, their work ethic is big. I mean, we're not saying you need to be working 120 hours a week, but really it's, it's I'd say coachability, working smart, when that gets back to hiring team, like who are some of the team that you've brought on? Like if you're, for us, if you're, uh, a lot of us, what we do is in technology. So is there, is the CEO more of a technical person? Do they have some sort of go-to-market expert who can, you know, compliment them where they're like, hey, I got the product, I've got the code, I've got, you know, a lot of what customers want uh, down. 
I just need someone to help me sell it, and they've done a really good job being that person to help them sell it, that's great. Or they're that person that helps sell the, you know, the business, the vision, et cetera, and they have you know, the X's and O's technology person on the side. Uh, the company I mentioned, uh, that Red Canary, that's gone from one to 100, they had three founders. They were all engineers, but they all knew how to sell. So they're sort of the, the, the magic formula, I would say, that we like solving for. Uh, but that, that's really the main thing, I'd say. It really comes down, if you're you know, employee number one, founder of a business, it's gonna come down to you, your vision, uh, and why you think this would be successful is what's really gonna matter the most. Okay. Um, so um, let's, let's talk a little bit about kind of the deals that you do. So how, about how many uh, entrepreneurs pitch to you, uh, to, to Norm Mosley annually? Yeah, we have, uh, uh, Client relationship management system, so CRM like Salesforce, uh, and we have I want to say fifteen thousand companies in that right now. Uh, in terms of what's added net new per year, and sometimes it takes two three years for us from when we meet them to when we invest in them. But in terms of net new companies per year, we uh, I would say we probably add like one or two thousand. And in terms of like number of meetings per year for the firm. I mean, me personally, I think I talk, you know, it all ebbs and flows. Like I have a deal, the fifth board seat I mentioned, is supposed to, it's supposed to close on Monday. It's probably closing tomorrow at this point, but I'll call it a fifth board seat. I feel like it's gonna happen. But that, because that we have a deal that's active that we're trying to invest in, that's gonna take my time away from meeting new companies. Cause I'm like, wow, this is a business I wanna invest in. When I'm actively trying to meet new businesses, like next week when this is closed, I'll probably have, you know, five, six new company calls per day during that week. So I'm, I, you know, at the highest rate, we're talking like five or six new new businesses that we're talking to in a single day. Uh, so you can, you know, do the math on that, the high end or the low end, it might be like two or three per week. And so that's me, I'm one person of nine people on the team. And like, you know, where, where am I? I'm probably, you know, everyone's trying to get around to the average that I am. So that sort of gives you a, a sense of, how many companies we're talking to, and so yeah, that's it's it's a lot, thousands per year. And so, how yep. many? Sorry, oh, yeah, I was going to ask him. Let me. So, how many do you typically fund each year? And then we'll go to GD. We aim to fund four new businesses per year. Okay. Thank you. It's been enthralling. My name is Chidi. I do have a question. Um, seeing as you have been in this industry for a while now, and you've worked with a lot of passionate founders and CEOs. I wanted to know, from your perspective, what does it look like to see a founder go from having the vision, getting that product market fit, growing, and then scaling, and eventually getting funding from investors? What does that story look like? Can you paint a picture? For us, it's it's having those sort of traction numbers that I mentioned. I mean, we're I, there's a huge qualitative component to what we do. There's no, I mean, two million in revenue is still very early stage, a lot fraught with risk. It's not nearly fraught with risk as uh, seed investing. Uh, you know, our, the venture, we're not, again, we're early growth, we're not necessarily venture, but venture, they're losing, for every dollar invested, they're losing 40 cents of that on a gross basis, and they're trying to make it up, you know, by, you know, 10, 10 times, making 10 times their money or 50 times their money, so they have like a 40% loss rate. Our firm, it's, you know, 15% is what we're targeting, so we're still losing money on these early stage deals in some cases. And you know, we have two or three per fund where we lose uh, you know, a significant amount of money on those deals and make up for it with the other ones. So what are the traits of the bad? What are the traits of the good? Well, the traits of the good, to see them get to our stage, I mean, it's uh, honestly, it's when customers come to us and say, because uh, we talk to customers all the time, this is a must have product. Um, you know, it makes my life so much better. The CEO is, you know, I've got a direct line to the CEO. The CEO, it, it, I mean so much to the CEO, founder of this business. We love seeing that. Uh, we love seeing, you know, again, there's data's kind of on the side, but you know, you're growing quickly, therefore you know how to sell it. Therefore you know uh, you have happy customers. It, therefore it's a clear problem is usually what happens when it's growing quickly. Um, I'd say those are the key things. But then when you sort of take that next step where you kind of go from like two to 10 and 10 and beyond, it's data, it's really having a grasp on data. What moves the needle in this business? 
people's a huge piece of that. So you got to be able to like hire smart people around you and attract smart people around you and have them up level. I would say with people, it's um, you know knowing when they may, may not scale. I mean, you can read anything on. So basically, knowing hey, this person's going to get me from one million to five million, but when we hit five million. I'm going to need someone else to get to the next level. That's what we honestly see a lot. And you can read, you know, Jeff Bezos is a case study in it. He had a new executive team every step along the way as he was marching from, you know, a dollar in revenue to, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue because he just had this relentless, relentlessly high bar for talent. And so that's what one thing we see that works is they have a huge bar for talent and they're always asking themselves, like, why, why are, you know, why can't I do better and why, and that up levels that for, for specific individuals. So that's one stage of it. You don't, I mean, at the stage you guys are in, you don't necessarily have to worry about that, but keep that, you know, in the back of your mind, if you're bringing on your first co-founder, your first employee, just having a very high bar, uh, you know, hire slowly, fire quickly is the old adage there. The other piece of it is just data, just knowing data inside and out. What moves the needle for my company specifically, for my industry specifically? Why are companies and what I'm doing, you know, valued? Uh, what are the highest valued companies on a multiple basis in my industry? What, what drives that? And back solving to like, what can I do with my specific company to drive that? I would say those are the sort of the key things that we see really work out well. Awesome. Yeah, so, um, so you know, you see, um, a couple thousand companies, your firm sees a couple thousand companies each year and you fund about four of them. So it, what is it that, that when somebody pitches to you, so we, you know, we've heard about kind of what the business looks like, but, but when, a, when a founder, how do, when they come to you, what is, is there, is there one thing in particular or, or a short list of things that you, those that you don't invest in are lacking? So there's a pretty, I mean, a big filter for us is, is getting down to that stage and that growth. So I, I would say, honestly, like, here's, here's how our process works. We have an intro call with a company, and that's like a 30-minute screen where it's, okay, is this the right fit based on geography? Well, we're going to know ahead of time based on LinkedIn geography. We're going to know ahead of time, based, most of the time via LinkedIn uh, or other, other sources, this is the right industry. So you're kind of already filtering there by the time that call is set up. The next step's gonna be, is this the right stage for me? So you kind of dive into like, is this an exciting industry? Like what is sort of that burning floor problem that they're solving? And you start liking all that, that's sort of an initial part of the 30 minute call. You're like, wow, this is a pretty cool business. What's going on? And then you get to the numbers and uh, you know, the company's growing quickly. It meets your sort of growth threshold. Uh, the company, you kind of just get the quick screen there and then you get data. So like once you get down to like, all that you're really have narrowed the filter and i'd say we start seeing you know product demonstrations or meet the rest of the team once that sort of narrow filter has happened and you're starting to like drip out you know five six companies per month that kind of hit that and then that sort of next layer down it's, it's really getting to know the ceo and if they're they are saying all the right things and they're well referenced um and you can just sort of tell by meeting the rest of their team that they've got a good bar for talent and then you talk to a customer or two and the customer validates your thesis or opens your eyes to this is a bigger problem than we thought it was which happens sometimes that gets us very very excited so i'd say just throughout that whole process what do we hear i mean there's you know the aha the aha moment and like the problem and them solving the problem that's a key thing um you know why is what you're doing differentiated uh, but then it's it's the C honestly the CEO's communication with us like are they uh, being transparent are they someone you'd want to work with and that's a rapport it's two it's two two way street right like you're going to want to be like hey I want to work with John or I'm going to want to work with you right and that's what you're going to want to see the entire time and that sort of rapport that you develop even if it is you know mostly over Zoom and then eventually you're going to want to see that person in person every you know. Our one mistake we made was uh, investing in a company that we didn't meet them in 2020, and that's not worked out too well. So, you know, I'd say like developing a rapport is a key thing. Yeah, big part of it is relationship building, right? Um, yeah, having having strong relationships. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, so so by when companies uh, when you're looking at companies, um, you know, they're at a certain place in terms of revenue um, and, and growth projections. Um, uh, what other sort of funding have 
uh, has been infused into the company by the time they get to you? And, and how do you, what, what types of funding are more favorable versus not, both for you as an investor, but then also for the founder and the company? Yeah, so when we involve, we call it, you know, white capitalization. So companies have had less than $10 million invested in it usually, um, which seems like a lot, but, you know, once they get up to $5 million in revenue, is, is it decent, you know, is still kind of at the threshold where we'd want to get involved. So sometimes we're the first capital in, they're bootstrapped. I have a company in Charlotte where we were the first, in, you know, first outside investment that I'd ever got into the business. It was at, you know, Three million in revenue when we got involved. Um, that you know, sometimes it's less than a million dollars. So it's you know, angel investors that have gotten involved before that. Uh, but I'd say, uh, yeah, I mean, sort of, we want less capital into a business usually because that demonstrates they've done a lot with a little, um, and they're very capital efficient. Um, so, so what are some? When do you need to secure capital? As a as an entrepreneur, what are you know when uh, because you you know you you talked about this company in Charlotte that's been bootstrapped, right? What at what point did that company decide we need to talk to Norm Mosley or other investment firms and, and seek outside capital? They realized they had a smaller market opportunity and they had an opportunity to expand their addressable market. So this is it's a pretty cool business. They are uh, you know a business management solution for breweries. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. We did some customer sites. Those were fun customer calls, but we'd go to brewery, you know, we, they had breweries started in Charlotte. So we'd go to like some, you know, customer visits and, and do some beer tasting. That was, that was good diligence. But um, anyways, we, uh, we realized like, okay, they're doing sort of, this is a vertical software business. They are only doing sort of one facet of business management for uh, breweries. How do they, you know, go from just doing, you know, the supply chain side to, you know, the customer side to the marketing side? Can they also take this and apply it to, you know, the distributors who are in the supply chain? Can they also take this software on the business management side and apply it to wineries? And so they realize they have this big vision where they could be for all do this sort of full suite solution for all craft makers. And they had this sort of cornerstone product that had very happy customers. And so we, uh, that was their pitch to us was, we are dominating this one segment. There's a lot, a lot of room to grow and it's still, we need help to expand our offering. And that's basically a lot of where our capital's gone to is, is some product, uh, is to their product roadmap to be able to address some of that. And they've done it uh, pretty successfully. So they've you know more than tripled in size in the three little over three years we've been involved. 